Okay, thank you. We're going to be starting, please. All right. Um, thank you for attending tonight's meeting. Sorry that we are starting a little a tad late. We had a finding a subcommittee meeting um, just prior to this, and um, it ran a bit over. Could you please join me in saluting the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, first item is the hearing of visitors. At the hearing of visitors, people are allowed to speak for three minutes. The school committee does not conduct a question and answer session. We take everything under advisement. Um, I will just say that prior to this meeting, we had close to 20 students who were here to advocate for the IB program. They felt it was uh, very beneficial for their education. They were very happy that at the finance subcommittee meeting, it was restored. Um, these students had, um, had statements to be read However, they opted not to since the program was reinstated. Um, but it just goes to show you that um, when students care, they show up. And um, we're proud that they are members of the Brockton Public Schools. So the first person that has signed up, may I please welcome Jennifer Anderson, uh, our known elementary school regarding reduction in force and budget cuts. Jennifer? Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, I am here speaking for the staff of the Arnon School. Um, we wanted to make sure that the school committee knew that equal is not always fair. While we realize the district is in dire financial straits, numerically equal cuts across the board at the elementary level are not equitable. The superintendent has mentioned time and again that given our location within the city, we are tasked with educating the neediest population. This statement is backed by data on the DESE website. As reported on the DESC website, the Arnone School has a population of 18.1% of students with disabilities as compared to 15.4% for the district. We have a high needs population of 75% as compared to 67.6% for the district. And we have 65% of our students listed as economically disadvantaged as compared to 53.2% for the district. It would not be fair to our students to take more money away from them when they're already starting behind other students in other schools within the district. <coughs> Additionally, our school is a level three school on the cusp of becoming a level four school. We are in the third percentile for the state. That means that 97% of the schools in the state are performing above us. The state was concerned enough about us to strongly advise us to apply for a turnaround grant due to our level. If the Arnone becomes a level four school, the entire district is labeled level four. Our staff has worked diligently on developing a turnaround grant that the state will fund. That work was based on keeping what we have and adding to it. With cuts to staff, we are concerned that the state will not fund our grant due to a lack of district support, which is a key feature of our grant. <coughs> While the district is funding initiatives, they are not supporting a viable student-staff ratio that will allow for academic improvement and sustainability. Had we been made aware of changes in staffing, the staff may have made different recommendations for the grant in order to provide help in the areas where there's going to be a need. Studies show that in order for students to improve, they need to work in small groups on targeted skills. Small groups are already at six students within our school. Anything more is no longer considered a small group. Additionally, students will not receive weekly work with the teacher if more groups are needed to be made in order to keep group sizes manageable and academically appropriate. Studies also show that smaller class sizes allow for more academic growth, something our students in a level three, almost level four school, desperately need. Thank you. Okay, next on the list is Faith Tobin regarding the budget. Hello. Hi, Faith. Not only am I a parent of two Brockton students and a teacher in Brockton, but I'm a third generation resident, graduate, and city employee. I say that so you understand that my perspective is global and I'm highly invested. What we do here is important and everybody needs to be sacrificing. Yet for the past several years, 
the only ones who have been sacrificing and sacrificed are the teachers. Teachers and direct staff are the ones making the difference year after year. They continue to be shown the door and are asked to do so much with so little. That burden has become too much to bear. At Brockton High alone, we are down 14 positions in two years, despite our growing enrollment. The cheap came out expensive last fall, didn't it though? Because the city had no choice but to spend dearly on a stopgap measure of adding subs, when our problems could have been avoided had our staff not been decimated. At the middle school, where our students are at their most difficult stage, teachers are cut again and again. And now you're even considering, even contemplating, closing a school. Yet, I have not seen one less administrative position. And now granted, my purview is small, but not that small. An administrative job is cut and then reappears under a new name with the same salary. I'm shaking. This is just showing how frustrated I am. Despite these cuts, the one saving grace for my sons and my students have been their teachers and their counselors. We continue to give 110% under incredibly challenging circumstances, and we usually don't complain. We don't have the time or the energy. Maybe that's why we're the first to go. It's those educating my children, not those analyzing their test scores, who have made the difference. I'm thoroughly aware that we have limited resources, but that hasn't changed for 30 years. Top-heavy staffing choices that have been made for several years have exacerbated the tight budgets to a crisis level. Clearly, clearly, the city needs to kick in significantly more money, and I'm, I'm sad to see that the mayor isn't here to hear me. And it needs to stop its own mismanagement. My taxes have risen 30% in the past six years. <clears throat> but I believe that the school department has misprioritized the limited funds that it has received. As the school committee and citizens of Brockton, it's our job to passionately advocate for our children. There has been far too much accepting of bad news without enough pushback. That's on me too. I've never spoken before. That's on me. I'm coming to the table late and I'm regretting it. This is why I'm boiling over. We need to act as if our own children's futures depend upon it. And thus far we have it. It's words, not actions. We've spent so much time and money trying to remind the state that Brockton kids count, it's time for Brocktonians to remember that too. Thank you. Okay, um, next is uh, Greta Zuckerveit. Uh, hi, Greta, how are you? And the topic says 1B? IB. Oh, I, sorry, IB. I sorry, I didn't write IB, okay. Um, I know that obviously the program is still being implemented, but I kind of want to come up here and say my piece just to kind of reiterate the importance of it. Um, so yeah. So my name is Greta Zhukoskaita, and I'm a proud alumna of the 2011 Brockton High School graduating class. Since then, I've earned a bachelor's degree from American University and recently completed a master's program at King's College London. I currently work with the future leaders of our city, country, and world at the Pluff Academy in Brockton, which is an IB World School. Being a former IB diploma candidate at BHS, I have a deep and personal connection to the program. At this point, you most likely know how the IB program is described on paper, what the mission is, and how much the program costs. How the IB program affects the future of students, teachers, schools, the community, and our world as a whole might be less familiar. The best I can do is explain the immeasurable effect IB has had on my life. However, in all honesty, what, can I only, what I can only say here is a glimpse into the program's lasting impact. As a high school student, IB molded me into a worldly thinker that was constantly challenged by literature, ideas, and assignments that weren't offered anywhere else. It placed me in a rigorous community of peers who forced me to think outside of the box. Teachers transformed into role models and mentors as we built symbiotic relationships while um, where learning was a two-way street. The expectations and high standards enforced in IB curriculum did not just prepare me for college, but allowed me to enter my undergraduate career with a semester worth of credits underneath my belt. It made me eligible for merit scholarships that co covered half of my tuition costs 
Anyone who has attended a private out-of-state college knows how essential credits and scholarships are to staying in school and graduating. But besides that, besides the express monetary value of IB, the program gave me the freedom to explore my interests that I didn't know I had. As an example, one of IB's lasting impacts was the opportunity it granted me to study abroad in London. This life-defining experience led me to apply to King's College and complete my master's degree. Today, I work with brilliant and exceptional students at the Pluff Academy, where the IB program is implemented and celebrated. I see the curiosity and capacity my students have for being cultured, lifelong learners. I see the benefit of the pillars of IB in their daily greetings, their interactions with peers and their teachers, and their incredible yearning and ability to think and act beyond the Brockton city line. Besides the run-on list of academic benefits I'm sure any student or teacher could tell you, IB helps students see themselves as an active catalyst of change in their local and their global communities. As IB learners, we start to understand what it means to be a citizen of the world. I understand anecdotal experience has a hard time measuring up against tangible factors like budget cuts. Numbers are easy to add, subtract, and use in models of success and failure. But lived experiences and our reflective narratives, however, represent vivid examples of those numbers and formulas. My experience as a lifelong IB student, as I like to call it, is personal but not singular, special but not an anomaly. We are a community and we'd be sincerely and deeply disappointed in the lack of investment for our future, present and future leaders, thinkers and lifelong scholars, scholars excuse me, if IB were to be cut from our schools. I charge you with the responsibility to listen and read our statements with foresight. IB not only sets up our students for success, but shapes our teachers, parents, our schools, and communities as pioneers in education who are dedicated to a more progressive vision of the future. It truly encompasses the essence of the City of Champions. Thank you for listening. Okay, next is Sue Galante Price. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, I've been here all my life and I've gone through the halls. When I went to school here, there was five libraries. Now we're down to three, and now they want to close them and make them computer labs. There's a lot of kids in this city who cannot go downtown and get the books, and why should they? And we have them here. I'm not happy about it, and I think you should do it to think about keeping them open. The students need them. Thank you. Erin McGuire regarding the Arnone School priority due to grant. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I heard it earlier be mentioned that the Arnone School was going to be a district priority for the 2017-18 school year in light of our level three status, almost level four, um, and in light of our MSV turnaround grant application. Um, I was hoping that you could soon clarify to us what exactly that would mean. Um, we are concerned as teachers about the possibility of the elimination of classroom teachers um, and how that would exactly impact our ability to implement and sustain these turnaround efforts. Thank you for your consideration of that matter. And, and Mr. Todd Erickson, VHS IB department head. I'm not a department head. Oh, okay. Sorry, Todd. <laughs> we don't want to be labeled a department head, huh? <laughs> How are you, Mr. Erickson? I'm, well, I like that. Huh? Thanks. Hi. Okay. Um, I just wanted to read a, a quick statement to uh, show support of my students um, and the, the program itself. Um, as I'm paid as, uh, to be the coordinator of the program and uh, one of my responsibilities would be to advocate for the program and to uh, provide information about it. Um, I can easily attain numbers, uh, program information, uh, budgeting info, which I already forwarded. Um, I'd, uh, that said, I would like to um, assert that I continue to be a, a teacher first. Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why I'm at Brockton. 
And I would like to take this opportunity to provide an uh, alternative perspective of the, the situation uh, just from my, my personal point of view um, and in support of the students. Uh, one of the courses uh, that IB offers uh, specific to the program is called Theory of Knowledge. Um, and it essentially asks students to analyze how we know what we know. Uh, and a part of that task concerns uh, growing a student's awareness, uh, courage, and creativity to understand uh, problems from different perspectives that are very different from their own. Um, this along with some you know, basic problem solving helps us to see problems from different angles and maybe bring light uh, to answers and solutions that we didn't see before. Uh, so when this news was brought to me uh, through <laughs> the regular rumor of grapevine, I found myself resorting to the, the thinking and interpretation that I, I usually do uh, regarding this, because it's been an annual thing. IB has been on the table for a while. Um, the program, having grown a little bit, uh, now costs about the same as uh, a possible teacher due to the, our paying for the exams and the cost of exams. It's not to imply that we necessarily pay teachers enough. Um, this is uh, the choice that I keep coming back to is IB or a colleague. Um, so that is the choice that it, it's proposed as. That's, that's how it's framed when uh, the cut comes up. But I, I realized that not only was that kind of the decision that was given to me, uh, but it was also something that I believed in. And I believe that because uh, it's very painful when I see a, a colleague cut or a pink, blue, slip, purple, <laughs> rainbow, whatever it is, you know. Um, and I, I, I understand where my colleagues come from, and I think it's, it's a reasonable understanding of the situation. And uh, I think that a good deal of my colleagues think the same way. And as a result, they don't, uh, IB is not something that they investigate. Uh, they don't seek to learn a whole lot more about. Um, I don't think it's closed-minded to see it in that way because uh, in all honesty, I think that the high school is understaffed. I think uh, if you consider class sizes, program cuts, uh, the possible rifts, the rifts that we've had, um, it makes sense to see it that way. But it's also not a certainty. Uh, so it is, it's not true necessarily to state or imply that if you are for IB, you are against a fellow teacher or colleague. Um, it's, it's actually it's a rhetorical strategy. It's called a uh, false dilemma. Um, if you're a lawyer, you might know. <laughs> but uh, the other common examples <laughs> would be, other uh, common examples might be, you know, if you say, if you're not a capitalist, then you're a communist. That's not necessarily true. I'm declaring neither. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, it ignores, subverts, and prevents other options from being seen. Um, it, so th this is kind of where we're at. We spend a lot of time and money thinking about time and money. Uh, and I think that uh, one of, uh, I don't think Principal Waller's here because she's ill, but one of the, the phrases that she's used a lot in the last few years was is the reality of the situation. I think somebody said it a few minutes ago. But the, and it's not a critique of her vocabulary uh, or uh, the use of that phrase, but uh, I think that she often uses it to uh, kind of bring a frustrated faculty and administration back to, uh, towards solutions in spite of what is evident and what is clear, uh, that we work in a school that has a lot of expectations, uh, inside and outside, uh, but it's not adequately funded. It's not adequately supported. And I'm not blaming anybody here for that. Um, the damage that I see done by the annual uh, budget crises, it's kind of like a, a birthday of sorts, is real and legitimate. Uh, one of my wonderful students yesterday asked during, I gave him an airing of grievances in class, uh, why IB was being cut. And I responded by saying that, well, it's actually part of a larger problem. Uh, there's a variety of things on the table. And she said, and I said, including teacher layoffs, that might be a possibility. And she said, yeah, but that's normal. And I said, no, you need to understand that that's not normal. None of this is normal. This is not why we're at school. It's not why public schools exist. Uh, so I would, uh, I'm not a citizen of Brockton. I'm not uh, saying that makes me better or anything like that. I'm just calling upon the citizens of Brockton uh, 
uh, to pay attention and learn about their schools. Um, I would be adamant that the choices take into consideration not only uh, dollars but also impact. Uh, impact requires that you learn about a situation and it, it brings us away from uh, numbers and uh, brings into a little bit more awareness. I would also uh, strongly suggest that we keep in mind uh, part of the reason why the, the situation was what it was, meaning we had a, a slew of students come in angry and uh, heated is the term, is because not only uh, the nature of the information shared, but also how it was shared. Uh, so uh, it's unreasonable to expect, uh, I think, a student or an adult to react with the utmost patience when the only information provided is that something's being taken away. Um, and it's an appropriate analogy might be, you know, if there's no traffic coming from the other directions, you can go right on red. So that's, it's kind of, they weren't being given uh, the information in, in a particular way that I think is important for students to receive it. Um, so I would close by adding uh, that these are a bunch of testimonials from uh, BHS IB graduates. I do think it would be very valuable and worthwhile for the system uh, to have a, a serious discussion about the program and if it fits Brockton or if it doesn't. And then uh, the quality of this, the decision made uh, will be uh, that much greater. So that's, those are my terms. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Because he was not a department head, he got a generous three minutes. <laughs> Do you, um, did you want to yeah, have us take a look at those? We can circulate them around to the committee. And uh, do you want us to get them back to you? We make copies and get, do you need no, them? No, I don't need them. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll get a copy around to everybody. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is a, an accumulation of routine matters in business of the school committee. Uh, it is bundled and um, presented to the school committee for approval. The school committee, any school committee member has the ability to remove an item for independent discussion. Uh, is there any item that any of the members would like to remove and discuss on its own? No? Okay, seeing none. Um, could I, could someone entertain a motion to approve? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. All right. Come to communication and the report of the superintendent of schools. Madam Superintendent, the floor okay. is yours. All right, we don't always have communication, but I did want to bring uh, to your attention that many of you know uh, during April vacation, uh, the district suffered a serious loss uh, of, of life, uh, one of our students uh, in a car accident that involved three of our students. Two other students that survived have long roads ahead of them. Um, you have teachers that have clearly been impacted trying to support students and families in our schools. We have coaches that had been with the students, you know, 10 minutes before the accident occurred that try to go about their business day to day. And I went to Brockton High School uh, last week, I can't remember which day, and when I walked in, uh, actually I think it was Wednesday, I think it was uh, Administrative Assistance Day, and I noticed floral arrangements on the, um, on the front counter. Well, these don't really do them justice. The roses here were beautifully red roses, uh, red and black for Brockton High. Uh, this arrangement were blues and whites and spring colors. And when I looked at them, I initially thought they were because of administrative assistance days. And, and while there were other um, bouquets on the administrative assistance desk, uh, these ones were out front. And in fact, what they were, were flowers sent to Brockton High School to the staff and to the students by our neighbors in the West Bridgewater School District, you know, sharing uh, and, and sending uh, condolences and support and from our own Cardinal Spellman High School here in Brockton. I thought that was a class act. Um, it was certainly um, something that, that I would hope we would do because we continue to try to support our neighboring districts. And I'm just very much appreciative. I reached out to both districts, uh, Cardinal Spellman and 
West Bridgewater to thank them uh, for, their, uh, for their support. So I just want to, to bring that to everybody's attention. Thank in, you for doing so. In moving uh, into um, our report, um, I do want to actually um, ask, uh, well, before I ask Jonathan Shapiro to come up here with, again, some wonderful news, I want to bring to everybody's attention that when you're having so many lows, it is wonderful to have a, to have a high. And to look at the other night, um, sent from Vinnie McCrina, the director of music, our Brockton High School band got to perform, although it was a lousy night, rainy night, they got to perform uh, the national anthem at the Red Sox game. And to watch our students, I, I wish I were there. <clears throat> I guess they made a day of it in Boston. They went to the State House with uh, Senator Brady, our legislative delegation. Um, you know, um, Mr. McCrina told me it was just a wonderful day, and I am so proud of their performance. And again, with uh, all of the things that we have to deal with that are very difficult, these are the very positives that come out of it. So congratulations to them. <laughs> and two other notes. So sometimes when, again, you, you think all is lost, all of a sudden a, a wonderful email appears. And the first one appeared, uh, again, uh, from Jonathan Shapiro, our department head of science, and so much more at Brockton High School. I'd like to invite Mr. Shapiro down here. <clears throat> but I want to congratulate uh, two of his teachers. And I just said to him, I said, Jonathan, would you please come up and share you know, your comments? And he said, well, I, I shared them with you so you could share them. And I really didn't want to. I didn't want to steal his thoughts. I very much read your comments and I'm so proud of the two teachers that I am going to mention. And yes, they are the people at the forefront. They're the people each and every day that are making a difference in the lives of our kids. And the first one is Angela Berganzi. Uh, she has been selected as the uh, 2017 Mass Maritime Academy Educator Alumni of the Year. And the other one, and <laughs> And, and I will have them stand up. Mr. Shapiro will acknowledge them separately. And the other one is uh, a woman that I have known for years. Our children played together. And I actually can remember this person when they were not a teacher, they were in the nursing field. And I was so excited when she was a change of career. And actually, that was probably many years ago. And that's Joyce Voris. <laughs> And Joyce Voris has been selected to receive um, a Secretary's Award for Excellent because of the Brockton High School Wildland Trust and Virathon uh, team, uh, and actually is going to be given, I believe the ceremony is May 8th, uh, coming up next week at 11 a.m. at the State House in the Great Hall, which is a wonderful, wonderful honor. So Mr. Shapiro, would you talk to us about both these fabulous teachers? Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's great to celebrate both of them as individuals um, and two members of a great department and a great school and a great district. So we're so proud. Um, but I'll address each of them individually. Um, I'd love if they would join me. That's a good idea. <laughs> you can't get away. <laughs> so why doesn't Angela Braganzi come down first? Join me in congratulating. <laughs> Um, I'm so proud to be able to, to recognize you in public, Angela. Uh, Angela teaches Biotechnology 1 and College Prep Biology. She's an outstanding teacher and colleague. The empathy that Angela has for her students is absolutely remarkable. Students in her classes know that their teacher cares deeply for them, each as individuals, and would do anything to help them find success in their biology class. There are other classes their clubs, and beyond the school walls. She truly exemplifies the Massachusetts Constitutional Clause that John Adams authored of a duty to cherish. She has extremely detailed and creative lessons. They're developed in collaboration with her colleagues. Angela is a consummate professional who's always learning and always contributing to the growth of the department. She's collaborating on the transition of the existing curriculum to help students master the new science standards and she's truly a model of boxer pride for her students. Angela, congratulations. Thank you. 
And Joyce, then, you're not getting away either. <laughs> Joyce Forrest, please join us. Well, this is so much fun. <laughs> uh, Joyce is an extraordinary educator, colleague, and student. She models a hunger for learning as she continually pushes herself through professional development opportunities, coursework, independent learning to stay on top of a rapidly changing field. Joyce shares this with her colleagues and her students for whom she's a great advocate. And in fact, that was the primary reason you're here tonight. Her students regularly perform amongst the best in the school in the science fair, as the scientific process is integral to everything they do in the classroom. That approach translates to phenomenal success in other areas of their biology classes and educational program. This particular award recognizes her work with the Envirothon team and the partnership that she's developed with the Wildlands Trust. Our team does extremely well in their competitions because of their incredibly hard work that is a direct result of her ability to recruit, inspire, and motivate. The complexity of issues with which her students wrestle is impressive, as is their teacher who helps them learn and understand the seemingly intractable issues while they develop the potential solutions. Joyce, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shapiro. Next, um, this is that time of year where we are fortunate to have a program that has been a long time uh, program in the district. I always take the opportunity to tell you I had the opportunity to do my administrative internship in the Brockton Public Schools in 1999. It was a wonderful time to experience parts of the district. I hadn't had an opportunity uh, to survey. Um, to look at different administrative positions, to have a project, and to make a difference uh, with a much needed uh, project at that point, which was your favorite policy, manual review. So this year, um, we are pleased to, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Kathleen Moran to come up and talk to us about our administrative interns. Uh, I will remind you, these are the best in our district who have applied and been interviewed uh, for these positions, they are assigned to not only our school teams, but they also are assigned to some of the central uh, administrative uh, offices and are working uh, on projects. So both supporting schools and working on projects. So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce them to you this evening. Thank you, good evening. Um, again, we have um, a great group of administrative interns for this year. Um, we're very pleased to have them on board and I'll introduce each one of them and ask each one to stand and, or raise his or her hand. The first one is Melissa Costello. She's uh, currently the Baker School Instructional Resource Specialist. <laughs> and Ms. Costello will be working with Sean Hearn, Principal of North Middle School and Dr. Salvatore Tarasi, Executive Director of Pupil Personnel. Our second intern is Denise Glennon, Brockton High School math teacher. <laughs> Ms. Glennon will be working with Ms. Marcia Andrade Serper, principal of the Angelo School, and Dr. Julianne Andrade in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Next, we have Courtney Johnson, Hancock grade four teacher. Ms. Johnson will be working with Ms. Colleen Proudler, Principal of the Arnon School, and Ms. June Saber McGuire, Executive Director in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Our next one is Lindsay Christensen, East Middle School Special Education City Resource Center teacher. <laughs> Ms. Christensen will be working with Ms. Valerie Brower, Principal of the Baker School, and Ms. Kelly Jones, Director of the Bilingual Department. Next, we have Mr. Stephen McGonigal, Brockton High School Spanish teacher. Uh, Mr. McGonigal will be working with Ms. Cynthia, Cynthia Burns, principal of the Keith Center, and Ms. Eileen McQuaid in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Uh, our next intern is Mara Mello, school, South Middle School School Adjustment Counselor. And Ms. Miller will be working with Ms. Mary Beth O'Brien, Principal of the Huntington School, and Ms. Karen McCarthy, Coordinator of Title I. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Maria Namey, Asheville School Math Teacher. Uh, 
And Ms. Namey will be working with Ms. Sharon Wolder, principal of Brockton High School, and Ms. Joan Farrington in the Office of the Learning and Teaching. Next, we have uh, William Sproul's uh, Champion School Self <laughs> Social Studies teacher. Mr. Sprouls will be working with, um, Ms. with Stephen Shaw, Principal at the Hancock School, and Mike Thomas, Deputy Superintendent of Operations. And finally, we have Maureen Woodson, West Middle School School Adjustment Counselor. <laughs> and Ms. Woodson will be working with Ms. Natalie Pohl, Principal of the George School, and with Laurie Mason, Director of Special Education. So thank you very much. Welcome to you all. And I will share with you um, as we move forward the projects that they're working on in the district. Well, that's a great lead in uh, for our last intern working with um, Laurie Mason in our special education department. Um, every year we have a special ed presentation. Uh, Laurie is here to update you on many of the, the continuing changes in the field of special education to talk to you uh, about some of the um, opportunities in Brockton, uh, some of the challenges that we face. And also, I want to remind everybody and Laurie that you know we're, we're certainly in the middle of the budget right now, but at some point we are going to be inviting uh, members from our CPAC. We have a parent group. We're trying to grow that group to those parents out there. It's an active group. We're going to have the parents actually presenting to you some of the concerns that they have or some of the programs that they would like to see for all of our students. So we will have that hopefully before the end of this school year. So Laurie, please come up. And Laurie does have a PowerPoint. Yep. I have an annoying cough, and I do apologize in advance. But I, can... I won't have a coughing attack. <coughs> oh, God. God. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, so just a little, um, little thing on the demographics. So currently we have about 17,000, well, a little bit over 17,000 students in the district. And I think earlier tonight Sal had mentioned um, our percentage flips, goes between 14.8 and 15.2 percent, um, and the state average is 17.2. So we're under the average for the state. Um, and we look at that as positive and negative. Um, we look at it as a positive that we're really tight in our process and that, <clears throat> not really a negative, but we really look at, sometimes we need to make sure that we're not missing kids out um, in our schools. So we're really tightening up our um, eligibility process. <clears throat> so there are four compo main components of um, special education, programming, compliance, support, and communication. And so when we talk about programming, we talk about special education is servicing students 3 to 22 um, who have a disability, um, providing them with specialized instruction and related services. And the goal is to provide accommodation, support, and remediation to students um, in the least restrictive environment. That is what special education is all about. The federal government <coughs> has um, seven IDA principles that govern it's the federal law that governs special education. So, and I thought tonight I would kind of focus on those because that, this is what drives the bus for special education. Um, these are the guidelines we must follow to make sure that all students are awarded um, everything that they need to get from special education. So the first one is free appropriate public education. And basically that is making sure that students um, are provided a free education um, the, at no cost to the parents that it's appropriate to their individual needs, that it's in a public school that all students with disabilities, regardless of their um, disability or the severity of the disability, or, um, have the right to be educated in the public school, and that they're educated on an individual basis. Um, least restrictive environment <coughs> talks about students must be educated in the general education classroom first, um, and, uh, and must be in, um, <coughs> Um, educated along their peers. So students in our substantially separate classroom must be um, integrated into specialist, art, music, phys ed, um, library, you know, any other 
um, specialty areas, go to lunch, recess with students that are not disabled. <clears throat> Least restrictive environment is um, really, when we look at programming, it's not a place. Special ed is not a place. It is, you know, we look at services for students. So we always look at, the first thing we look at, the option of providing education in the gen ed classroom. <clears throat> um, the individual education program I call the roadmap for students with disabilities. That outlines their program from the eligibility process to what the nuts and bolts of what they need to be educated and then the place where that takes, where that happens. <clears throat> Appropriate evaluation is when students are up for an evaluation, we're supposed to evaluate them in the area of need or their suspected disability. Um, the people providing the evaluations must be knowledgeable and trained in that, <clears throat> in that assessment um, and that we use the most up-to-date evaluation tools. Parent and student participation, so we want students and parents to be part of the IEP process. Um, we start inviting students to team meetings at age 14. In the year the student is turning 14, so if they're 13 and then that year they have an IEP meeting and they turn 14, they're invited to the team meeting, they get their own invitation, they're on the attendance sheet, they participate in their um, IEP meeting. Um, <clears throat> now parents have the right to determine whether or not they want their student part of the process. Some parents will say that they want them to um, attend at the end of the meeting or just at the beginning of the meeting because there's a lot of things that are said at a team meeting that um, some parents feel they don't want their students, their own child to be to be part of that. Um, this is really important process for students to be at the team meeting because it really allows the team to hear what the student has to say and that kind of drives where they're going in, the, in their transition years. <clears throat> the procedural safeguards are the rights for the parents outlined by the Department of Ed, the Bureau of Special Ed, that outlines for parents what their rights are if they dispute or disagree with an agreement, with um, a decision made at a team meeting. Um, about two or three weeks ago, I did a parent training on the procedural safeguards, parent rights. <clears throat> I did it through a PowerPoint, and I'm going to be putting it up on the web page for parents to know what their, what their rights are as, um, for their students. The last one is right to educational achievement, and I actually have that here on the slide because that's the newest one. Typically, for years, there were only six principles of IDEA, and they've just recently added this one a few years back. <clears throat> and this really talks about ensuring that students and um, special ed students have the same expectations as gen ed students, that the goals are the same, that we provide them with everything that gen ed students have, that they have access to assessments and appropriate accommodations, um, and that they have that right to, to make progress in, in, the, in the gen ed setting too. <clears throat> okay, let's take a sip of water, so sorry. Compliance is basically my job in special ed that I need to make sure that all the timelines are followed for the team process, that we, f we're, we make sure that compliance is met in every aspect of that team process, from generating the consents, to completing the assessments, to having the team meetings, <clears throat> to determine the eligibility, develop the IEPs, make sure that we have appropriate progress reports, one of the most important things we need to make sure is that we address the parents' request and any concerns throughout the IEP process and, that we, f and we follow all the procedural safeguards. This is basically um, the job of the special education department is compliance. Now, <clears throat> the, when I did the parent meeting a couple weeks ago, these were a lot of the things they were asking me about, the timelines, um, getting their assessments before the team meeting, what does eligibility mean, um, and this is a piece that um, the superintendent was really stressed that that parent component for the IEP process, we need to, to make sure that we have that additional piece. So uh, my intern does not know this yet, but that's going to be one of her additional projects, Maureen, so um, is going to be working on developing a, a guide, a parent guide to the IEP process. <clears throat> So another part of my job is to support not only um, the special education staff, but the gen ed staff, providing trainings and workshops, um, attending regular meetings with the building administrators, consulting with all personnel and parents, and providing workshops. One of the things that we have put in place last year, um, 
is Kelly Jones and I are working, and mostly Kelly Jones, um, are developing, um, the state has determined that all teachers need to have 15 professional development PDPs for special education and um, English language learning. So Kelly and I have developed a team, and like I said, it's mostly Kelly Jones, has developed this team of working, um, having teachers providing workshops and trainings for teachers and within the district. And we've had really a lot of great success with that. And since, um, so we started this in the summer of 2016. We had five courses. We had 142 participants. The fall, we had nine courses with 183 participants. Um, this past spring, we have 14 courses. We have 286 participants. Our total is 611 participants from the Brockton Public Schools are being trained in special education or English language learning, which is a great, um, it's not only required by the state, but it really gives our teachers an opportunity to, to take some workshops and get some more information, but it also allows our teachers to collaborate and work together and to provide these trainings for our teachers. <clears throat> And then we're doing, we're providing parent workshops through the Parent Academy and also through our CPAC. Um, and um, one of the things that I'd like to work on, and we really need to build up our CPAC, is to do um, some surveys to the parents on what type of workshops they would like to see um, and when they would like to have them. Our nighttime is, is difficult for some parents to get out and do some training, so we're going to have to look at whether we have them in the morning or during the day or at, at night. Um, and communication is also the, the biggest mantra for my department. Um, I commit to an open door policy. I want parents to be able to come in and meet with me at any time. And not only parents, teachers, um, administrators, anybody who wants to meet with me, I'm, I'm wel welcome that. Um, I, we, would try to ensure, we do ensure that all communication with parents is provided in their native language, and we also promote that homeschool connection. Um, I think parents, and I said this at the, at the training, the, the biggest thing that people want is, is to, be, to get, um, have communication with, with their teachers or with an administrator or the principal or, or, or the director of special ed, that if they call, they want to call back. And I, 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 I said to them, it's like when you're on, the, you're on an airplane, you're on the tarmac and the plane's not moving and nobody will tell you why and you're sitting there for hours and hours and you're getting frustrated. I don't like that feeling myself and, I don't, and that's how parents feel when they make a phone call and no one gets back to them. So if I say to my, the special ed teachers and, and the staff in my office that if a parent calls, call them back, see what their concerns are. Whether you have the answer immediately, tell them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find out that answer because parents want communication. I think that's, I think that's the biggest part of our job is communication. Um, and upcoming dates, my favorite day, Special Olympics is May 24th at Brockton High School at 930. Um, you'll all be receiving your invitations. Um, if you come, it's a, great, it's a great day for our students with disabilities. We have a lot of fun. Um, our next CPAC meeting is May 30th at 6.30 at the Arnold School. And the Department of Ed is coming out on my, uh, May 31st, Amanda Green from the Transition Department. She's going to be coming out to look at our programs. Be, um, <clears throat> We have a lot of communication with her through Laura, uh, Laura Albert, who's our transition specialist, um, and they're very interested in our post-grad programs, what we're providing for our students in the community. Um, I did write a grant um, that is allowing students with disabilities to get out into the workforce, and with the help of um, Mary Beth O'Brien, who's connected me with some Campello businessmen, we're going to be actually looking at employing some of our students and providing them with some on-the-job training, and we had a breakfast um, last week with some of the employers, and um, they were really, you know, very vested in the project. And she would like to come out and see where we are with that, and look at our postgrad program at the Key Center, and see what we're doing with students at, at the Brockton High School. So we're very excited about that visit. Short and sweet. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? I did it kind of fast. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry. Yes. Who determines eligibility? So the team, given the, um, so a student is evaluated in the area of the suspected disability, so the team will come, um, will meet and review the evaluations. The team discusses each evaluation, and then we use the Massachusetts the flow chart to determine where they fall for dis a disability. Um, I've encouraged the parents 
I mean, uh, team chairs to have that eligibility flow chart on the table, listing the disability category. So if a team is is really con um, can't determine what that disability is, that they they go down and literally go through each one of those disability categories um, to determine that. If a team can't come to a consensus, it's really the team chair's responsibility, as stated through the Department of Ed, that they pull that team together and really guide the team to figure out what that disability is. And what if the parent doesn't agree with the results of the eligibility? So if a parent doesn't agree with the results of disability, typically they, they, they may ask for an independent evaluation. So when a parent does that, I call that parent myself. Every single parent that has a disagreement, I have a conversation with them and I say, what else, what, are the, what don't you agree with? What, what is going on? What other assessments can we do? Um, how can I, you know, I, I review all the data before I call a parent. So, and if, if the parent and I have a conversation, we do talk about independent evaluations. Um, sometimes the team is at the table and their team is struggling to figure out what's happening with the child. The team knows something is happening, but the test results aren't giving a specific disability. So, the, you know, then we come back and say, oh, well, maybe the parent will have an independent eval that can give us more information. Um, we try to follow the process really tight because when you follow a process, things are very clean and clear. Thank you. So, yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, I just, it, I like that you're putting together the, uh, the parent's guide um, and. Uh, Maureen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that you're, that you're doing that. One of the things I would like, because I've, I've gotten questions and I'm and, and still learning about a lot of this, <coughs> um, is when that's ready, um, if maybe all of us could could have a copy of that because it will certainly help us Absolutely. out when we're getting calls from, from constituents with questions and concerns. And I think we, we sometimes take for granted when a parent's sitting in a team meeting what it's like for a parent to be at a team meeting and have a team of people talk about their child with a disability or may not have a, dis a child who's struggling in school. And I think we need to make the team process much more parent friendly and then be able to give them some information before they come to the team of um, different um, things that people may be talking about and understanding the process and and um, one of the things I, I met with my team chairs just kind of brainstorming and is a checklist for the parent to actually have in front of them like we discussed this we checked it so we're not missing things or if we do discuss something that a parent doesn't know what we call that that they that everyone that we're on the same page but I'd be happy to share that because I think that's really important because yep. parents and students are the biggest part of the process and I think a lot of parents walk away with, I know I just had a meeting, but I'm not really sure what happened. Right. And are afraid to ask questions. So I'd be happy to share that. Great, thank you. Mr. Sullivan? <coughs> Excuse me. Nice. <laughs> nice presentation. Thank you. I, on your, there was a slide there with federal guidelines. Yes. And there's about 10 of them. Is there enough money to do everything that we're asking? Um, well, I want to say something about special education. I, I'm, I feel I'm very fiscally responsible. I look at every program that I have. I, I, I'm very, I'm really good with the budget, not my own, but the special education budget. Um, I think that the Broughton Public Schools, we follow the, the principles of our DEA because I think that we do provide students with everything that they need. Um, special education is costly because you need you must provide what kids need what kids what students need on an IEP um, and that's what we went through in the finance meeting about the different specialized equipment and all that um, I mean I I think we do a really good job in Brockton in special education um, I think we do meet the kids needs, the students needs and I think that you know it, it financially right now we're we're handling it in special ed. Thank you. Well, Today. Also, um, you just went through a coordinated program with yes. you a year ago. So there were many <coughs> things that Brockton was, you know, given accolades for, for the types of program, for opportunity, for access, for all of the things you saw here this evening. And then there were other things that you've taken some corrective measures. We've, as a group, started to look at ways yes. that we need to uh, improve our <coughs> special ed programming and this is a process that goes on is it every six years 
Yes, every six years and every three years is a mid-cycle review. So, so we did have, a, we are in the process of a program review for the special education department. That was, that's um, through this coordinated program review, every two years you're supposed to evaluate your programs. So we, we, we're in that process right now, but we're looking over in the next three years to really look at, we, um, under, right now we did Brockton High School and our alternative schools is, our for, is, is phase one. So when we get that report back and we look at you know, where we are in, in special education, year two will be an implementation year for that group, but year two will be the next group will come in. We're gonna look at our middle schools. And then once we look at our middle schools, the third year will be an implementation for them. Then we're gonna look at our ML elementary schools and our preschool programs. So when, the t when mid cycle comes out in three years, they're gonna say, Where's your we're gonna have our program review ready to go. They're gonna review it and make those determinations. Do we, you know, do we need to improve our programs more than what we've already done from the, our, our original report? Um, and then three years, so every six years we have this, the, the coordinated program review and the mid cycle comes in every three to make sure that we're, we're still continuing to provide students with disabilities what we're supposed to. So as a district, we continually look at our bilingual program, our special education <coughs> programs. Many of them, again, have compliance issues, yeah. all of those things you looked at this evening. Um, and again, we it's, it's a continual uh, improvement mm -hmm. process for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about the talk. Um, under a uh, budget update of uh, uh, this this evening, we had uh, probably our tenth meeting on the budget during our uh, finance subcommittee meeting. One of the things I led off with, which I do believe is a big piece, is our advocacy piece. And this has been non-ending, I would say, for the past at least the past two years. And you've heard a lot of people speak this evening. You heard residents speak, you heard teachers speak. And I couldn't agree more with them. But quite honestly, this has been um, a very difficult process. And as I said during the subcommittee meeting, what we continue to do right now is to build our budget back. And, and you're, again, your you're hearing of the visitors and those that spoke are correct. This is something that the city owns. This is something that the residents own. This is something that the state owns. Everybody has a part of this. And I invite anybody out there uh, last year we did have the Brockton kids count and it made a difference. It was something under direct certification where all of a sudden you heard the numbers, 4,600 students fell off our rolls for additional money we got in a foundation formula for poverty. And it was close to $6 million. I want you to think about that $6 million back in our budget this year with some of the decisions we have just had to make. So the continual discussion about the Brockton kids count and quite honestly, when we label it this year, it isn't just going to be Brockton Kids Count, it really is Save Our Schools, Brockton Kids Count. Because it does matter. It matters that teacher in the classroom. It matters about the research of the number of students. It matters about the curriculum. It matters about the tier two interventions. It matters about the special education students. It matters about the talented and gifted students. So we are going to, again, continue. You heard me talk about advocacy with the house budget. I think it made a difference. We're waiting to see what that foundation pothole fund looks like and are we a part of that. Yesterday we met with the Deputy Commissioner of Education, Jeff Wolfson. The mayor sent a letter concerned again about the state support for our budget, about the direct certification, and about a charter school that was brought into our district with very little planning, um, concern about, as a matter of fact, it opened up in Norwood, did not open up in Brockton, did not give us a chance to adjust uh, any of our schools and actually one year in it's very difficult to do that. We had a lengthy discussion yesterday and we have the opportunity to follow up with Senator Brady and a legislative group uh, meeting with the House Ways and Means um, on this Thursday morning. So we will continue our advocacy um, at the next finance committee, we'll, committee meeting where we, we will be talking about where we go from here. It is time for our community to come together, our teachers, our parents, our students, and start to talk about that advocacy. Advocacy with your elected officials here in the city, your state delegation that continues to support the work and is making a difference. Uh, as far as the budget this evening, 
It's a budget that I have labeled irresponsible. And what do I mean by that? I have told you back when we started this process and when we took out all of the things that we recommended to support our school, because we knew we were facing a $16 million deficit. So it is irresponsible on, it is not the superintendent's recommended budget, although that's the label that's given to it, because as Todd Erickson said to us, you know, a, a line that is used is that's the reality that we're dealing with at this point in time. Uh, I give you credit, you have looked at every part of that budget. I have talked with you at 10 o'clock in the evening, I've talked with you at seven o'clock in the morning. We've followed up on concerns, we've followed up on ways to save in the budget, we've talked about efficiencies, we've talked about your priorities, we've talked about building the budget back as we go forward. And I thank each and every one of you. There might be things that you differ on as far as priorities, but really you're very close in what you want for the children in the city of Brockton. So um, I, I, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Minicello, who is just gonna read the figures at this point that you voted on during your subcommittee meeting here. But I commit to everybody out there that we can, will continue to identify funds, set your priorities, make sure we're bringing teachers back in the classroom and continuing to balance so that we can operate as a district. And I do want to make it clear, I'm not apologizing for a district. A district, while the teachers are what happens every day, and they make a difference for our children. You'll hear me tonight talk about how proud I am of the district with the MCAS testing that's being done. Many of our, dis many of our schools, uh, grade eight and grade four, for the first time online testing. And that just didn't happen. It wasn't something we were completely prepared for as a district. We don't have one-to-one -one devices at this point in the hands of every student. But you had your teaching and learning teams. You had your accountability teams. You had administrators working with your leadership teams in the schools to make that happen. And word getting back to me is they did an excellent job. Our children have had a taste of what online testing is about and what it means for those students that in 2019 will be taking that for their high school diploma. So it does take a district to build a school system. And the success is for every single one of us to come together and to make sure that we have the best school system that we possibly can. And that's through advocacy, that's through continuing to look for efficiencies, that's continuing to look to balance all of the things that you were able to do in this budget so now we can build it back with your priority items. So Mr. Minicello, do you wanna read where yeah, we're at certainly. with the budget? Um, with regard to tonight's budget, uh, for those who were at the finance subcommittee, it might be a little boring. However, um, the superintendent's recommended budget, which really wasn't a recommended budget, it was simply a level funded budget carried over from last year, was 177 million 38,000 and change. However, from uh, being provided by both the state and the city, we were um, allotted 161 million dollars. That basically accounts for the $16 million budget gap. Um, no one on this committee, nor in the superintendent's office, um, is pleased about these numbers, nor uh, are we satisfied. I will say, however, that um, we have visited the state, uh, we have advocated with DESE, we, um, continue to speak with our delegation. We um, are consulting with our attorneys and I'm going to do the best we can with what we have. Um, like I said, no one is happy about these numbers. Um, the pain with regard to this budget is gonna be shared with respect to programs, uh, different uh, bargaining units, um, it's, it's a budget that no one is happy with, but it's something that we need to do at this point in order to move forward. Like last year, the budget was um, at times a moving target. So we are hopeful that there will be some additional funds. However, this evening, um, we had to base our actions on what we currently have. Um, I am a bit optimistic that things will get better. When I say better, I don't mean that um, we're going to have a check for $16 million, but I think that we will have some additional funding that will um, take some of the pain off of the, some of the different uh, 
sectors that have been hit the hardest. Um, the school committee, I'm very proud of all of you. Um, we do not agree on everything. We have different perspectives. Um, but everyone uh, has put in the time and um, dealt basically with the stress of the figures and of the budget. So um, I thank you for all serving with me. And um, uh, you've done as good a job as we can do under the circumstances. So um, this evening, we basically uh, had to take a vote in finance so that we can move forward um, with regard to the reduction in force notices that need to um, go out by the uh, May 15th deadline. Um, unfortunately, no one was happy about this, but um, the allocation is, uh, at this point, 189 um, RIF notices uh, with regard to certified teaching positions. In addition, uh, 64 involuntary transfer notices uh, with regard to some of the administrative positions um, will take place. And uh, those notices uh, are sent out uh, and will basically rework some positions in terms of um, adapting them to try to fill the needs of the system uh, through uh, creative um, reworking of job um, of job duties. Um, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to have to, you know, adapt based on the numbers that we have. Um, so that being said, um, you know, I would implore the citizens of Brockton to, you know, get involved, uh, advocate on behalf of the Brockton Public Schools. This is a school system that basically beats all the odds. Um, you know, there is no other school system like the Brockton Public Schools. And, and like the superintendent said, you know, our students the other night were at Fenway Park. What other bands are at Fenway, high school bands are at Fenway Park? If they are, they're elite bands. And guess what? We have one of the most elite in the state. Um, and that's because of the highly motivated and hardworking staff that we have here at Brockton High. And I don't mean that just with respect to the bands. You know, we had kids here tonight, you know, advocating for the IB program. You know, these are some of the nicest, finest kids that we have. And, um, you know, they're smart enough to know that that is a beneficial program that helps them later on um, with respect to uh, graduation and uh, being able to eliminate classes at the college level um, and save, save money uh, on tuition. Um, we have wonderful staff that, uh, that uh, are instructors and teachers, you know, with respect to all of our programs here. Um, you know, the Brockton Public Schools really knows how to get it done. And, um, you know, for those people who <coughs> want to say, well, you know, you do too much in this area or too much in that area, you know, that's, that's bull. We, we, know how to, we know how to improve our test scores. We know how to get kids to succeed. And, um, you know, this is just a hurdle that, in my opinion, uh, the state unfairly places in front of uh, a district like Brockton, but um, you know we're not going to sit idle, and um, we will continue on onward and upward, as they say. But um, you know, again, no one's happy about this budget, but um, I have all the faith in the in the staff and the and the teachers of this district um, that um, we will manage to to get through this, um, and we will together um, rebuild and also try to um, improve upon what we have here tonight. This is unfortunately uh, the starting point of where we need to be uh, based on what we have, but I, again, I'm hopeful that uh, there will be some supplemental funding that uh, will assist us and help us uh, deflect some of this um, pain. Thank you, Mr. Minichello. 
Um, as far as items to refer to subcommittee, our items that we're um, working on right now are certainly policy items. I think those dates are set. Um, I also want to say um, at this point here, we have uh, not received uh, our allotment for non-net school spending, which includes your busing. Um, understand that is the policy that we continue to talk about, uh, looking at uh, your registration process, looking at going back towards neighborhood school. That's a multi-year process, but again, something that we um, are going to be dealing with in our policy meetings going forward. Any other items to refer to subcommittee at this point? Uh, Mr. Thomas, did you want to refer something to some? I think we have a date coming up for the policy subcommittee already, so we'll add that. Yeah, I, okay. Um, with, uh, with regard to transportation, um, we needed to speak with um, first student. Um, Okay, all right. So we have an idea okay. of what so, we're dealing with. So perhaps at the next time. Um, but understand that is a concern for us right now is yeah. waiting for the non-net school spending, particularly our transportation costs, uh, and looking at the busing that we're going to be able to do in the district. Okay, all right. Um, unfinished business. Mr. D'Agostino. I was kind of debating whether I was gonna say anything or not, but um, uh, I apologize if we're jumping back to the, the budget for a minute, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, a couple things. Um, first of all, at the, the last um, finance meeting prior to tonight, um, I asked the superintendent to shave an additional half a million dollars and with support from my fellow committee members out of uh, the six million in planned um, RIF notices and I know that that took a lot of effort and not only did you do that you know but you also were able to honor that request and bring a few other things back um, and then also leave us three hundred and seventy four thousand dollars in the budget to determine in the future what we want to do with so um, I, I I know that required some additional work on your part and I appreciate you doing that um, <clears throat> so uh, and you know I've gotten a lot of, like everybody else, calls about the budget. How, why are you cutting this? Why isn't, don't you think that's important? And honestly, this all goes back to, in my opinion, a few things. Um, you know, a charter school that was rammed down our throats by an unelected and unaccountable board, in my opinion. Um, the community said no, and they said you're getting it anyway. And so certainly that is hurting us. And $5 yeah, I mean, if we had another $5 million, we wouldn't have just taken the vote that we took tonight, or, or at least the numbers would have been much different. Uh, well, and that's the next thing I was going to comment. So there's $11 million of our $16 million problem. $11 million of that comes from decisions that have nothing to, not nothing to do with us, but that we don't even get anywhere near. And that's the final point. You know, the governor decided to change the way that economically disadvantaged was counted, arbitrarily not counting 4,600 of our kids. Just because Charlie doesn't want to count them anymore doesn't mean they're not here and doesn't mean that they're no longer economically disadvantaged. They're very much still economically disadvantaged. Just not counting them doesn't change anything. And I, I'm just... I know everybody else is too horrified and disgusted that this is where we are with those two ridiculous decisions, $11 million of that 16. I mean, if all we had to do was solve a $4 million problem, how much better off would we be? So anyway, I, I apologize for kind of 
going off on a tangent there, but I just needed to say that. Appropriately said, and that's what I mean by, you know, this isn't over. Yeah. So we're not going to just sit by idly and take a $6 million hit with regard to direct certification. So. Yeah. I know. So time will tell. Ms. Plant. I just want to say in regards to the time that we had to vote for the budget barometer, I deeply regret that it's happening during Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, and I've been thinking about that all day today. Um, I work with little ones. And as we're being acknowledged and appreciated, it was disheartening to think that we had to come here this evening and vote on a budget that is not what anyone really wanted. And as Mark just said, you put a lot of work into, you listened to us, you addressed our concerns, you did the best you could. I do commend you for that. Um, in regards to the people that came and spoke before us uh, for the R Known School, I believe we will listen to their concerns and do what we can to help them stay on the path of success that they're on right now. I look forward to being part of that process, especially in regards to the grant that they're applying for. I look forward Bless to getting you. information. Bless you. Um, and also, I want to thank this committee for recognizing the value of the Project Grads program because nobody did come and speak before you. These are people that didn't have somebody to come here tonight and speak on their behalf. And so I want to thank all of you for recognizing that they need us to look out for them as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, new business. New business. Um, I think everybody has been watching. As a matter of fact, just this past Monday, we had um, a day without immigrants and a day where we look at our district, which we always consider the richness of our district, is the diversity, the diversity in so many ways. So we've had a number of other things that obviously have been our priority items, but I think the time is right. I have shared with you, and I want to read um, into uh, the minutes, uh, a letter that I am preparing to send out to uh, our community. Uh, I've also certainly worked with the mayor. Uh, we've uh, presented to the school committee what we're calling a resolve. And this isn't changing any policy. This isn't changing the way that we operate about our students. Every student that comes through our doors deserves an education, deserves an opportunity to succeed. It is the American way. It is what we do for residents of our city. Um, we're working right now on getting uh, banners, and that is for money that we presently have in the budget, not next year's budget, if there are possible savings to have welcoming signs in every language that when you walk through the doors of our schools, you are welcome to come into the Brockton Public Schools. So this letter um, is Dear Brockton uh, Public School Community. The Brockton Public School District is committed to creating an atmosphere in which every member of the school community is valued and respected. This commitment is part of Brockton Public Schools' mission to teach students in a safe, supportive environment, the knowledge, skills, values, and behaviors necessary to become responsible and productive members of a diverse society. We celebrate our individual differences and seek to build upon them in our quest to strengthen not only individual students, but also the community at large. As national current events unfold before us, I would like to affirm the district's commitment to providing a safe, welcoming, and inclusive environment where each student may enjoy a free public education, regardless of a student's disability, race, color, ethnicity, national origin, sex, immigration status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Earlier this year, President John Donald Trump signed executive orders relating to border security and immigration, calling for the detention of undocumented immigrants pending the outcome of removal proceedings. These executive orders have created uncertainty and anxiety in our community. Please know that the Brockton Public Schools will continue to fully protect its students and their federally and state created rights in the school setting. The Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy has issued an advisory that provides enrollment practices that single out students based on their actual or perceived citizenship or immigration status violate state and federal law. Furthermore, equal access to public education means not only the right to enroll in school, but also the right to an education free from unlawful discrimination and harassment. We support the right of all Brockton residents to enroll in and attend our schools free from harassment and or discrimination. The Brockton Public Schools assures parents and students that the district has developed plans to address any attempts 
by immigration officials to gain access to student record information or to enter school property. Moreover, the district has plans in place to assist students in the event that parents or guardians are detained by immigration authorities. Please contact the superintendent's office for additional information. Very truly yours, Superintendent of Schools, Kathleen Smith. That's That is an initial attempt. There are some things that I am going to be reviewing in that letter. We want to create not hysteria, but a safe environment for all our students and family coming to the Brockton Public Schools. We are working on, again, uh, protocols in place to make sure that um, if our students were to encounter any problems, that we are able to support them uh, so that they are protected in that way. Are you have a resolve before you? We have reviewed this with our legal team. We have made sure, again, that we're not putting at risk any federal funding. That's not what this is about. These are about the policies that you already have in place. It's not creating additional policies. OK. Um, I think it's pretty clear that um, the district cares for all of our children and um, will continue to do so. Um, so. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt the resolution and approve the letter for distribution, please? Okay, anyone second? Okay, any further discussion? No? Okay, all of our kids are welcome. Correct? Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take care of that. All I'll right. send the final draft out to you. There are a couple of updates I need to make on that. Okay. Um, next item. You have the uh, bid review report. Mr. Diagostino, are you the chair or is that Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Sullivan, how about a report from bid review? Gives me something to do. <laughs> we always want to hear from you. The bid review subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee convened tonight, which is Tuesday, May 2nd, at 5.45 p.m. in this little theater at Brockton High School. All were present, Tim Sullivan Chair, Joyce Azak, and Mark D'Agostino. Also present was Mike Bandus. The meeting was called to order at 5.45 p.m. after discussion of the fiscal year 17 playground relocation bid, a motion was made by Mark D'Agostino, seconded by Tim Sullivan. The motion carried, Joyce Azak abstained from the vote. After discussion of the 2018 Energy Management Control Service bid, a motion was made by Joyce Azak to accept the bid as presented. The motion was seconded by Mark D'Agostino. The superintendent recommends the following motions. Motion to accept the report of the subcommittee as presented, and a motion to recommend to the Brockton School Committee to award the following school bids. The name of the bid is Fiscal Year 2017 playground, playground Relocation Bid, the amount of $68,450. And Fiscal Year 18 Energy Management Control Service Bid, a three-year total of $122,680. And I have to put these two motions forward. Motion to accept the report of the subcommittee as presented. Sorry, it was All seconded. Yep. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And there's one more motion there. Okay. A motion to recommend to the Brockton School Committee to award the following school bids. I'll make that motion. Sure. We need a second. Second. All in favor? Any further discussion? None? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Great, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. All right. The next item is the finance meeting report of this evening. Um, the finance subcommittee met this evening at 6 o'clock. It was a rather lengthy meeting. It went over by, I think, about 15 minutes. At the meeting, uh, the agenda was as follows. Uh, we discussed the FY18 budget. The superintendent provided us with an update regarding advocacy. 
um, informed us about her meeting with State Auditor Bump. Um, in addition, talked about the, um, the Foundation Pothole Fund and at this point uh, Brockton was uh, not a beneficiary of any of the um, funding that came out of that uh, uh, new formula. Uh, she informed us of her meeting with uh, Mr. Wolfson of DESE. Uh, also uh, told us about her meeting with uh, Senator Brady and the um, upcoming uh, House Ways and Means. Um, Sal D. Domenico? Is Sal D. Domenico. Yep, Sal D. Yeah, Domenico. So you'll be meeting with him? Thursday at Right, okay. Um, we talked um, a little bit about the economically disadvantaged um, uh, items and Mr. Petronio was present for that uh, discussion. We talked about uh, Title I funding. The superintendent was pleased uh, because it's her feeling that Title I funding will be available. Um, in addition, we, she recommended that the IB program as well as project grads um, not be removed uh, and it, the, both, both those programs uh, going forward next year will stay intact. We went over the budget barometer um, with the figures that are part of the uh, FY18 budget barometer presented this evening. Uh, we discussed uh, the Save Our Schools and Brockton Kids Count campaign uh, and advocacy. We had a um, presentation by uh, Dr. Tarasi with respect to uh, the items regarding school uh, psychiatrist and the benefits, financial benefits that, that um, presents itself. Overwhelmingly, the um, savings outweighs the cost. Um, I believe that was the, the uh, content of that meeting. Um, any disagreement on that? No? Okay. Um, motion to approve the um, finance the minutes of the finance subcommittee meeting that took place this evening. Motion to approve the minutes of the finance subcommittee meeting. Second someone? Any further discussion? No? All in favor? Okay. And then the second item out of that finance subcommittee meeting uh, came the uh, approval of the FY budget barometer with regard to the uh, recommended 189 um, pink slips, uh, RIF notices, and the 64 uh, involuntary transfer blue slip notices, um, together with the um, items on the recommend uh, recommended eliminations from that budget barometer. Um, motion to approve. Someone? Second? Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. All right. Um, I have some good news. Um, we have Sister Act coming forward with respect to the um, musical this uh, year. Uh, the musical is always a wonderful um, event. Uh, the music will be Friday, May 12th, Saturday, May 13th, and Sunday, May 14th, uh, obviously here at the um, uh, at the uh, auditorium and um, tickets are available. I believe um, you can get them here as well as I saw people this uh, weekend over at Shaw's selling tickets. Um, in addition, um, you can also donate. Um, there are um, several different um, amounts that you can donate or simply, you know, donate whatever you can afford if it's not on the uh, flyer. Um, Donations can be made payable to uh, Brockton High and just in the check memo um, you can put uh, for Sister Act. In addition, um, we have a fundraiser with regard to the drama department. Um, everyone likes the Texas Roadhouse, or I do anyways. Um, uh, on uh, May, Saturday, May 6th from 11.30 a.m. lunch to 4 p.m. If you present uh, this coupon, I believe it's also online. Uh, and if you take a photo of it on your phone and just show it to uh, your waitress or waiter, um, you can get a 10% uh, donation uh, from your bill donated to the um, drama, Brockton High School Drama Club. So um, if you're planning on going out to lunch at the Roadhouse or want to, um, please utilize this um, fundraiser for the drama club. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. It does. Oh, dine in or takeout. Yes. So takeout is available. So. Oh. Okay. Great. Excellent. Is your daughter in it? Yes. to try out for one. This is her, her first one that she'll be in, um, and she's very excited about it. So I, I do have tickets if anybody wants to purchase them. Great. Um, Mr. Gormley. There's also a fundraiser May 10th um, in the Access Center. I believe it's at 7. It's in the evening. Um, I can't find the detail on that. But it's to benefit the Brockton High School track program. Um, we have a group called the Friends of Brockton Track, who's headed by uh, myself <laughs> and uh, Kristen Alice McNevin, who are both track alumni, um, are the, our track coaches, Coach Campbell, Coach Fidalgo, Coach Russell, Coach Hoffman, and Coach Canavan have all been very supportive of this. It's a LuLaRoe fundraiser, which uh, I know is very popular. <laughs> um, and all proceeds will benefit the track program. We're trying to have a ba uh, banquet this year. Uh, which we haven't had. I, when I was a track athlete and Kristen was a track athlete, we'd have a big banquet every year and get certificates and we'd always get our jackets and things like that. So we're trying to bring some, something like that back to a program that uh, includes about 300 students um, and they don't get uh, a banquet like a lot of other teams do because they're so big. Um, and we don't have the funding source that we used to have. Years ago, we'd have a big state meet here every year and raise a few thousand dollars. So um, on top of that, we are open we've opened the snack shack for track meets which we have one tomorrow um, at 3:30 against BR so it's a dual double dual meet with both both men and women's teams competing against BR so there should be a lot of people there hopefully it's nice out we've lost a lot of meets to rain this year so thank hey. you uh, anyone else um, Friday night we had uh, the junior prom I uh, I did not hear any uh, Negative reports, Mr. Thomas. Can you uh, just give us an update, perhaps? Yeah, I think the superintendent was there, but uh, I talked to Spalding and a couple of the deans. Um, I have my phone on all night, the night of proms, just to, you know, and then pray that it doesn't ring at one or two in the morning. So happy to announce there were no incidents. Uh, That's beautiful great. night. Everybody looked beautiful or handsome. Um, um, what's that? Men could be beautiful. They were. It was. It was wonderful. <laughs> You're <to> beautiful, <laughs> Brett. <laughs> I'm handsome. <laughs> <laughs> but I also invite you again to the Brockton High School Senior Prom at Patriots Place. We have a group going. Um, and it really is worthwhile to see just that venue and how excited our kids are to be there, the support they have from staff that make that night what it is so our kids can enjoy um, just a, a wonderful, memorable event. So thank you to all the teachers, the chaperones that make that happen for so many kids. We're a large, obviously, the largest high school around. So to be able to have a venue where everybody can come in a safe surrounding and uh, they just love going to see obviously Patriots uh, Stadium, Gillette Stadium. And I do have to, uh, when we talk about end of the year and some of the moves that are happening in our district supporting our students, our half a day, and again, I said it last week, I think I'm safe to say that June 22nd, it is a Thursday, is our last day of school. It is always a half day for students and staff on that day. But the two previous days to that, which would be Tuesday the uh, 20th, and Wednesday the 21st, presently our full days. I would like to recommend that week that we have a full day on Monday and have a half day on both Tuesday the 20th, Wednesday the 21st, where our students go home, our teachers are able to pack, our teachers are able to prepare for the next year. If they're not a teacher that's being relocated or a school that's changing, there's certainly plenty of things that they can work on in their own classrooms to prepare for uh, ending the school year uh, in the summer. So we do have the amount of time that we need. We've checked that at this time also. We don't want to run afoul of that. So I'd like to uh, recommend you add two additional half days for students, not for staff, for students. And again, the last day is a half day for everybody, just to clarify that. Um, Ms. Azak, did you have your hand up? Did you? Uh, I, I did actually. 
actually. Um, I had the opportunity of attending the junior prom on Friday. I completely forgot about it. And I was just very impressed as to how organized the check-in was. Everyone was just so respectful. And they all looked like they were having a wonderful time. So definitely looking forward to going to the senior prom. And I would definitely recommend a few of us go as a group. Um, Miss June Saber McGuire was actually there with me also. So it was definitely, I hadn't been to a prom in quite some time. <laughs> Probably about 20 some odd years. <laughs> we laughed because of our friend Mike Healy, who that was the best line ever when Mr. Healy showed up and it was his daughter at the prom. Can you imagine? Well, and we did Ms. all Grant, we could. Uh, Ms. Plant. Um, That's why I wasn't able to attend. Right. <laughs> I got correct. permission, but she still. She, yeah, she did. She actually talked my daughter into it, but then I felt like I would have got dirty looks all night. So I, I didn't go. But I'll be at the senior prom. Well, the best part was when Mike Healy said to everybody, you know, I think he said directly to you, haven't you been to one of the Brockton High proms? Oh, yeah, my own. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was just one of those great lines. I don't go to my, I wouldn't go to my daughter or my son's prom. Well, I took advantage of it this year. Next year, I'm not allowed with my niece. That's so right. I figured that's, this year I'll go. That's the rule. God love Mike. Hmm. So the half days? Would you like a motion? Is Please. That, oh, you need a motion. Because I'd like to adjust okay. the calendar. Uh, someone make the motion. Motion to change the calendar to have two half days on the 21st and 22nd. Correct. Uh, excuse me, 22nd is the last day, 20th, 21st. 20th it's it's 21st. a Tuesday, Wednesday. To make Tuesday, Wednesday, the 20th and 21st, right. half days for students. Okay, someone needs to second that. Second. Mr. Sully, um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. Oh. Sorry. I am a little concerned because I did receive um, lots of, I've been contacted by parents about the half day and mm -hmm. do you have more on our schedule? I know it's, you know, it's for professional development but it has been brought to my attention that some parents do find it a hardship. Um, so I, I, I don't want to express the concern that I have yes. heard from some parents that this can, especially if we're voting on it now, to happen you know, this year. I, I do feel we could have some parents that feel like this is um, going to be an issue. I've had parents reach out to me about the half-day professional development days, which again, when you look at the budget, and I'm not talking about our budget right now, but when we look at the cost of additional time after school hours, it just becomes something that at this point in time, we were not able to do. Those professional development days are needed. It supports instruction. Um, we tried to give parents you know, in our calendar as much notice as possible. I think we did add the past couple of years. We have finally stabilized as to where we're at. These are additional because of the moves, because of a lot of the uh, changes in location, building changes, um, and, and quite honestly, uh, some of the changes that we voted on this evening. So we just felt in order to allow our district to pack up for the summer or to get ready so we're able to open in September, it really is a necessity. Just, would it make more sense to change the schedule so that it was, so we have a full day and then two halves instead go to two fulls and then just end the day earlier and give the teachers that full day to we can't do that because of the 180 days. That's what the 22nd is. That is your 180th day, your 181st for your teachers, okay. since they come back a day early. So, that's, that's so it is it is reaching our 180 sure days. Does that affect our hours too? Are we over hours? Yeah, I, we had looked into that, so yeah. we were able to recommend it. We're you know we're, we're there, but we're not uh, putting ourselves at risk or compromising the state stepping in and questioning our hours, time and learning. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Okay, all right. Okay, I just have two quick items. Um, we talked about National History Day and our three student groups, uh, one from West Middle, uh, two from Pluff Academy, going to Washington, D.C. Um, I do want you to know that we've reached out to the parents. We follow through on the policy that you put in place, and we actually had an anonymous donor come forward with the cost for a parent uh, to go on that trip. We've been able to share that on, among the parents that are going at this point in time. Next year we will fully implement our policy of a chaperone and also making sure that uh, people take um, account of what National History Day is providing, which is the dormitory, the bus, et cetera. So I think you've put something in place. I want to thank the anonymous donor 
it's really made a difference uh, for our families to be able to attend and enjoy National History Day with their children. And we'll provide you hopefully with you know positive results. Just to be there is something that we're very proud of. Thank you to all those teachers and staff members. I also want to say uh, we do recognize our teachers. And uh, I really did not realize myself that this was uh, the week to recognize our teachers. Thank you for sharing that. I think I need to pay more attention to, to some of those wonderful things that happen. And I want to thank our teachers in the Brockton Public Schools and teachers everywhere that make a difference in the lives of our children. And I want to end by congratulating uh, Patty Minicello. And Patty Minicello has lasted 25 years with ta today is actually tonight their anniversary. And he has chosen, I agree. I agree. That's for Patty. Poor Patty. It is for Patty. Mm. Mm. So I am honored that you have spent the evening with us on your 25th wedding anniversary. That is true dedication. Mm, thank you. Patty's not honored that he spent the evening with us. <laughs> She's good about it. I invited her to come. She's good about it. I'm sorry. And, and I miss didn't all this. Her. Yeah, so. And that's it. All right. Well, thank you, I think. So, um, any further business? Seeing none? Oh. Joyce? I had the opportunity of attending Brookfield's PTO meeting last Monday. And like many parents, um, everyone's concerned about the budget that we're dealing with. And everyone wants to help out in any which way they can. So I'm challenging the other PTOs to join Brookfield in having a huge uh, fundraiser. So I know, Mr. D'Agostino, you have a pretty active PTO. Ms. Plant? Okay, Mr. Gormley, um, Ms. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, they want to plan something huge. And whatever money we bring in, we'll kind of just offset some of the stuff that we're cutting, the fun stuff uh, that's affecting the students. And I'm glad you brought that up because I told you on Tuesday we'll share with you, we've put together our advocacy piece I needed to get through this evening. So that was bringing your um, PACs, PTOs together, so we will. Everyone's willing. Yeah, Everyone okay. wants to help out and, and fundraise, and that's the one thing they're saying. What can we do? Fundraise. I think it would be a great idea for all of our schools to share what their successful fundraisers have been and share those ideas. I know one has been um, the fun run that a lot of our schools have participated in that, and um, that's one I think that's fairly easy on mm -hmm. the staff it doesn't require a lot of work from the PTAs, and it, it's bringing in money, and it's getting our kids out there and exercising. So I think that's a wonderful idea, and I love the, um, the concept of our schools sharing and participating in these challenges and, and really rallying together and yeah. supporting one another. You know, it's a unified pack. Couldn't have said it better. I think so. As a, as a small group, they're bringing in, uh, you know, the fundraisers are bringing in money. Um, the fund run brought in quite a few dollars for Brookfield. Um, they're thinking, what can we do with other PTAs or PTOs together if our small group is bringing in this amount of money? So that's why they said, let's challenge. We're thinking an annual district fundraising agreement. I think it's awesome. We have, we have the facilities for it. big thermometers. That's a good idea. In. That's a great idea. <laughs> Save our schools, Just Brockton Kids Count. So, um, as I said, we have been working on it. Um, Michelle is uh, unable to be here this evening, but that has been her focus while we've been working on the budget. So, we will, uh, that'll be our next meeting. We'll have some detailed uh, timelines for you. Okay, good. Anyone else? All right, thank you for attending. I know it was a very difficult meeting. Um, motion to adjourn, someone? Second. All in favor? Thank you for coming. <laughs>